The seasons march at your command. The old departs, the new year comes. And though celestial is your gaze, you search and care for all our Guide us through each day. Oh, how we want to follow you. Come, living way, our way may clear. Let perfect love drive out our. Good afternoon and Happy New Year to everyone. It's uh, our first month of the year and same time, first Sunday. And uh, we welcome you all here in, at Bangyai Baptist Church online worship service. And uh, I'm going to read here in Proverbs chapter 3 verses uh, 5 and 6. It says here, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He will make straight your path. We'll sing, Change My Heart, O God. Love. 
Father, we praise and thank you for this another year, another opportunity for us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Guide us, Lord, be with us. And our prayer, we are asking for the help of the Holy Spirit, Father God. And uh, salamat sa uh, pagpamayo ni Musamun last year and we're praying for this year, Father God. Padayang kami, you know, mag, uh, palapit, you know, dira sa inyo. Change our heart's desire, Father God. Namun nga tinutuyo, na maging kaangay ni mo, you know. Tagi kami, sing kaalam, faithfulness, kag, uh, kapisan, you know, as we continue sa pag-alagat sa inyo sa sinya kalibutan. This is our prayer, everything is given in our heart, in Jesus' name. Amen. Another hymn will sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Bibles with you there. You open it 
The book of Mark, Mark chapter 2, verses 18 to 22. A question about fasting. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and people came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guest fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one show a piece of unshrunk clothes on an old garment, and if he does, the patch tears away from it, and the new from the old. In the worst, tears is made, and no one puts new wine into old wine skins. If he does, the wine will burst, the skins and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins, but new wine is for fresh wine skins. May the Lord, may the word of God, who bless us, to read that. We will sing another song, What If It Were Today.
time to Pastor Jeff for our welcome and announcements. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Bangye Baptist Church. This is the first Sunday of the year. We thank God who has been faithful uh, to us all throughout 2020. And uh, he has given us his grace that uh, we are still alive and healthy on uh, this first Sunday of the year. Uh, but it is with sadness that we cannot greet and welcome each other face to face. As we have announced yesterday that uh, our uh, Sunday services both in Thai and in English uh, will be moved um, online. And so, uh, because our area here uh, in Bangyai, especially in the Talat Bangyai area, is currently under, um, uh, under control or highly controlled area because of the rise of COVID uh, cases. And because of that, we will monitor the situation as of now and um, we believe that uh, cases can still rise, uh, especially after New Year. And yet, um, we thank God that this will not hinder our uh, time for worship and to honor Him on this uh, very special day, on the Lord's Day. So hopefully right now, uh, you are uh, gathering your family, uh, your friends, uh, and worshiping with us online uh, in the safety of your home. So I pray that you're preparing your hearts and you can also share this live stream uh, to uh, your friends and your family so that they can worship with us and they can uh, receive blessing from God's word together with us. So as of this Sunday, we are online. Uh, as of next Sunday, uh, I believe we will still be online. And from this onwards, how long we will meet online, uh, that depends on the situation. And supposed to be, this is first Sunday, we will have our communion. And yet, because uh, last time when we had our online worship, uh, we refrained from celebrating the Lord's Supper um, because of that. And so, um, we will also, this time, as long as we are worshiping online, we will still refrain uh, from celebrating the Lord's communion uh, as soon as uh, there will be other uh, changes that will come. And so, uh, because of this, uh, you can still worship the Lord uh, with our offerings uh, through our online giving, our, online, uh, our church bank account. Uh, uh, you can ask from uh, our, church our church treasurer, uh, Manang Lisa or Manang Julie, uh, uh, you can ask the account from them so that you can deposit. And we ended the year on December uh, saying we will have a project, our keyboard, our instrument for our uh, worship department. Uh, it is our target to raise 10,000 baht for, for this project. And we have said we will buy it on this month, January. And so our treasurer asked us, that if you will send her the money intended for the keyboard, please uh, kindly note or send her a message that that amount was intended for the project that is not your regular offering. So hopefully everyone is staying safe and everyone is staying healthy. Um, and so welcome to our worship service this afternoon. And before we listen to God's word, uh, we have the privilege to listen for a very uh, special music uh, to be rendered by King. Shut your command The old departs The new year comes And though celestial is your gain 
you search and care for all our ways we offer up to you this day and all of our tomorrows may zealous youth and cautious age determine not the steps we choose rich effort guides us through each day oh how we want to follow you come living way our way make clear let perfect love drive out our fear be thou our vision now and here and all of our tomorrow Winter makes us reminisce Of warmer days so distant now A cherished saints the sun once kissed Whose beauty passed behind the clouds Let all our fond and longing tears Remind us we are pilgrims Trust you, sovereign of our years, with all of our tomorrows. And to the plow we're pressing on, and running hard to win the prize. Powered by the love of God With grace before and grace behind For love would hope before us stands You finish all that you began Eternal joy is in your hands And all of our tomorrow But hope before us stands You finish all that you began It's a choice in your end And all of our tomorrows And all of our tomorrows Good afternoon, everyone. For our study of Scripture this afternoon, shall we turn our Bibles to Matthew 24? And uh, we will be studying uh, in continuation of what we have started last Wednesday uh, in our family camp. Uh, we started studying Matthew 24, verses 1 to 14. And for this study, we will uh, look further, uh, starting from verse 15 down to verse 31. But we will just read verse 15 to 22. So if you have your Bibles with you, please open with me there and we will read it together. Uh, Matthew 24, verses 15 to 22, the Word of God says, So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. And let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant, for those who are nursing infant in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Shall we commit this study to the Lord in prayer? Father, 
we thank you for the opportunity that even though there are a lot of things going on around us and yet we can spend this time on reflecting, on studying, meditating and be allowed to be spoken to by your word. I pray that you would clear our minds from any trouble, from any hindrances, from any sin or from anything that would hinder us from hearing you and from seeing what you want us to see and what you want us to know and what you want us to believe and to follow as we seek to know you more and the plans that you have for all the ages. I pray that your blessed Holy Spirit would be pleased to work in our midst through the proclamation of your word, that he would enable your servant and enable the hearers to see and understand and be doers of your word, not hearers only, to the glory and the honor of your name. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. When the COVID-19 pandemic started, um, which was an event after the Taal volcano explosion in the Philippines, after the Australian bushfires, the California wildfires, I think after the COVID-19 started, there were two reactions of Christians that I noticed on the internet. Either some Christians were evoking Bible verses for God to protect them, like Psalm 90, or they were calling on verses on the end times that there are signs that Jesus is coming soon. Pestilences, diseases, and earth-shattering events, earthquakes. So these reactions might, might have been prompted by our stock knowledge on the matter about the signs of the end times. Um, understandably, these people might have heard sermons about it or read it for themselves in their own personal Bible reading, but without a clearer and better understanding of what these signs mean, we believers can misapply them. If we don't understand them better or clearer, we can misapply them. We can feel things or do things we shouldn't be feeling or doing. So that's why I have shared it uh, to our session last Wednesday that I have been praying for this year and God has led me that our church theme for this coming year is the theme, the God of tomorrow. We will study the book of Revelation. So while it is not my first time to preach through the book of Revelation, but this time around, I want us to start with the teaching of, of Jesus himself on the matter. That's why we come to Matthew 24 and 25. These two chapters, Matthew 24 and 25, are often called the Olivet Discourse because according to verse 3 of chapter 24, Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives when he spoke these words. And this is part of the grouping, a fifth major teaching recorded in the Gospel of Matthew concerning the prophetic overview of events that will happen both in the near future and the distant future when Jesus said this. This teaching was addressed to his disciples and it is intended to give them a prophetic overview of the events that will happen in both the near future, that will happen near their time, and some of it will happen, or if not most of it, will happen in the distant future. So here, Matthew 24 and 25 contain some of the most important prophetic material in all of Scripture. And we have said last Wednesday that our question for this study, both in Matthew 24 or uh, especially in Matthew 24, will revolve around the question of the disciples prompted um, uh, by, the, by the prophecy of Christ that he, he told them in verse uh, 2 that the temple in Jerusalem, that magnificent temple, will be destroyed. So their question in verse 3, if you look at verse 3 of chapter 24, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age so our, our question for this study will remain the same what will be the sign of the coming of jesus and the close of the age or the end of the age and when will these things happen actually jesus addressed these questions uh, their questions in reverse order first um, he did not answer when will these things be. 
So he first answered, what will be the sign of his coming and the sign of the close of the age? And we have said last time that this uh, teaching in Matthew 24 can be And we have said last time that this discourse in Matthew 24 can be divided into three, 24 and 25, will, can be divided into three parts. Uh, verse 4 to 31 is a general chronological description of the events preceding Christ's return or uh, description of events that will happen before Christ will return. And starting from verse 36, that is on uh, our next lesson, up to chapter 25, verse 30, are lessons on watching, waiting, and being prepared for Christ's return. So it will be more practical because Jesus does not want them to only know what will happen, but he, want, he wants also to teach them what to do in light of the events that are coming. And he ends this in chapter 25, verses 31 to 46, of warning them of judgment and a promise of reward at the time of his return. So in our message in our family camp last Wednesday night, we have taken up Matthew 24 verses 1 to 14. And to recap that session, we have learned that in verse 1 to 3, it lays out the setting that prompted the questions of the disciples concerning the signs of the coming Messiah and the end of the age. Since Jesus was predicting that, that the magnificent temple of Jerusalem rebuilt by Herod the Great will be destroyed in verse 2, he said, You see this magnificent temple and yet not one stone will be left that will not be destroyed. So, since he was predicting that that temple will be destroyed, they were, the disciples were thinking back to the time when the first temple of Solomon was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 BC. They were thinking back during that time because that time, a period after the temple was destroyed, the kingdom of Israel was restored. So they were thinking in parallel that if Jesus is truly the Messiah, now that he's predicting the temple, to be destroyed, the kingdom of Israel will soon be restored. And he will come. He will come. That is the Greek word parousia. And reveal himself as the Messiah, the King of Israel, the Son of David, as God has always prophesied. So they were excited that if Jesus is really their King, now that he is predicting the events, the signs that are similar to what had happened in the past, so now he will reveal himself as the king. But then they did not realize that it will take a longer time for Jesus to come and reveal himself. Thus, we learn that in verses 4 to 14 here in chapter 24 are general signs of suffering that will happen to the world and to the believers in this age before he comes. It will be a general event that will happen to all. It will describe the characteristic of this age before Christ will come again and before Christ will come again. And as he has described it in verse 8, all these are just the beginning of birth pains. By saying that in verse 8, he's telling us that um, it will just be a start. It will get worse. Both to the unbelievers and for believers. So, for believers, the sufferings will especially happen without the church or outside the church and even within the church. And in verse 14, he ends that section by saying, the gospel will be proclaimed to all nations, to all tribes. Then the end will come. He starts now to answer their question, what will be the sign of the end? So verse 15 to 31 is a continuation of the sequence of events that Jesus wants believers to know and to expect about his coming and the end of the age. And as we have said last time, Matthew 24 verses 1 to 31 is like the movie trailer, a recap of what will happen in Revelation chapter 6 uh, to chapter 19 that we will study after we have taken up Matthew 24 and 25. So 
what we will study here, we will study more in detail when we get to Revelation 6 to 19. And yet we thank God that Jesus himself took the time and the effort to give us a capsule, a recap, a thumbnail, a trailer of the greater details that he will reveal through the Apostle John in Revelation 6 to 19. But our question for this study, like we did last time, is still the same. What will be the sign of the coming of Jesus and the close of the age? And when will these things be? Now take note that Jesus, the, answers of, the answer of Jesus to these questions apparently intertwines prophecy or uh, interweaves prophecy concerning the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 and his second coming. Um, uh, some of it will happen in AD 70 and some of it will happen similarly but in greater degree when he comes again. So both the near event, which is the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, serves as a symbol and a foreshadowing of the more distant event, the greater event that is his second coming. So we will jump back and forth between those two key events, AD 70, the destruction of Jerusalem, and his second coming that we are still awaiting. So now in verses 15 to 31, Jesus moves from the general characteristics of this age to describe the great tribulation that will precede or that will come before the coming of the Son of Man. Now take note that this portion of the Olivet Discourse or teaching is crucial to understanding what Christ reveals about the end of the age. Because there are some who has the tendency to explain this section away or ignore it, which constitutes the major difficulty in the interpretation of this Olivet Discourse. That's why last time we have presented you with four possible, uh, with four interpretations that are existing out there. So uh, liberals tend to discount prophecy and practice and the practice of some conservatives of not interpreting prophecy literally. So there are liberals who do, who do not think that this will happen literally. And there are some conservative Christians even that uh, understand this will not literally happen. And yet, uh, let us look at what Jesus uh, said further here in verse 15. Look at verse 15. So when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. The sign of the future tribulation here in verse 15 is identified with what Christ calls the sign of the abomination of desolation. The event is so specific that it will be a signal to the Jews living in Judea at that time to do what in verse 16? To flee to the mountains. So what did Christ mean by the expression, the abomination of desolation? Now, this term, abomination of desolation, is found three times in the book of Daniel. Uh, and several times in Jewish history, it was thought that this prophecy was being fulfilled. Jews were thinking that the abomination of desolation prophesied by Daniel was already fulfilled, but most notably and clearly during the days of Maccabees, when one certain Antiochus Epiphanes IV the Seleucid king or the Syrian ruler reigned over Syria in 175 to 164 BC, about 400 years after Daniel. So let us look at how it was defined in the book of Daniel. Daniel 11.31, uh, Daniel prophesied and said, Forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and the fortress and shall take away the regular burnt offering and they shall set up the what? The abomination that makes desolate in the temple. Okay, so um, as this was fulfilled in history, it is comparative, e comparatively easy to understand what da Daniel meant. To refer this as something that previously already had happened 400 years after Daniel, then years later after Christ has said this, they can look back and think this have already happened. 
because Antiochus Epiphanes desecrated the Jerusalem, uh, the temple of Jerusalem by setting up uh, the image of Zeus to be worshipped there in the temple. He offered swine or pigs, something that is unclean. He offered it in, in the altar to render it polluted, unclean, desolate, to disrespect it to the greater degree. He stamped out circumcision, which is a standard religious practice of the Jews, and he killed many Jews. And what Antiochus Epiphanes did um, 400 years after Daniel prompted the rebellion of the Maccabees. Uh, their leader, uh, one named Judas and his brothers and many others, which uh, they put up the resistance against Antiochus and won. They lit up the candles in the temple and miraculously, they say, it lasted for eight days. Thus, the present day celebration, Hanukkah, by the Jews. Uh, they celebrated it, uh, I think, right around before Christmas or during Christmas time. So, this future... Uh, Abomination is described further in Daniel 9.27 and he said, And he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week and for half of the week. He shall put an end to the sacrifice and offering and on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. He or the prince that shall come shall confirm or make a strong covenant with many, uh, which many believe that to be Israel for one week. Interpreters say that this one week, it means seven years. As all commentators would agree on that. And the prophecy continues that in the midst of the week or in the middle of that seven years, um, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. For the overspreading of, of, of the abominations, he shall make it desolate. Okay, so the prediction is that a future prince that will come, will do just what Antiochus did in the 2nd century BC. Further light is shed here in Daniel 12, 11, when Daniel said, And from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away, and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, there shall be uh, 1,290 days. This is a specific day, or a, an approximately three and a half years preceding the second coming of Christ. So Jesus, by saying, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, it happened once during the time of Antiochus in the 2nd century BC. However, Jesus was clearly looking toward a yet future, another abomination of desolation. Now, some suggest that this prophecy was fulfilled in AD 70, when Titus invaded Jerusalem and destroyed the temple or rendered the temple a bomb, an, uh, desolate and he did abominable things in the temple. And yet some uh, uh, suggest that this would look further toward in the future to a greater fulfillment because Paul and John, the Apostle John, even saw a still future fulfillment when the Antichrist sets up an image in the temple during the future tribulation in the last days. Let us look at two verses uh, that both Paul and John himself uh, prophesied. 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4, Let no one deceive you in any, any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first, and the man of lawlessness, this is the Antichrist, is revealed the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that what will he do? He takes his seat in the temple of God in Jerusalem, and when he takes his seat there, proclaiming himself to be God. Further, in Revelation 13, 14, we will study this in detail when we get there. And by the signs it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet live. There will be an image set up by the beast, which is a symbol for the Antichrist. And what will happen there? Verse 15, it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. There will be a worship of the image of this Antichrist 
in the temple in Jerusalem. So these events might have taken place um, when Jesus said this, when you see the abomination of desolation in verse 15, this could have taken place in AD 70. But what Paul and John, especially John in particular, prophesied further could not have happened in AD 70 when Titus destroyed the temple. Because there was no worship of an idol in the temple there. And many commentators agree that uh, the book of Revelation was written way beyond AD 70. Most of them would agree that uh, Revelation was written 90 AD. That, that was the last book of the New Testament. So they are looking for a yet future fulfillment of this. This is the sign. The Antichrist will come. He will set up an image of himself in the temple to render it desolate and do abominable things there. Now, William Kelly said something uh, helpful. He said, the conclusion is clear and certain. In verse 15 of Matthew 24, our Lord alludes to that part of Daniel, which is yet future, not to what was history when, we spoke, when he spoke this on the Mount of Olives. So when Jesus said this, the Jews might have recognized Antiochus in the second century BC, and yet this could speak of something yet coming in the future. H.A. Ironside said, Our Lord tells us definitely here that His second advent or second coming is to follow at once upon the close of that time of trouble. So it is evident that this day of trial is yet in the future. So although the people of Jesus' day would not see the final events of the world's history, many of them would certainly see a foreshadowing of those events. We have said at the outset, at the beginning of this, that uh, both these two events will interchange or interweave um, with one another. The, the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, they would, many of them would live to see that, but it would foreshadow a greater event, the event of the coming of the Antichrist. That's why John Walford said something very interesting. He said, these predictions in verse 15 have raised questions concerning the, me the meaning of Israel's present occupation of the city of Jerusalem. Because if sacrifices are going to be stopped in a Jewish temple in the future, it requires first that a Jewish temple be built and second that the sacrifice be reinstituted. So when Christ points them to the prophecy made by Daniel that there will be a temple and that that temple would be rendered desolate and be done abominable things there, in the present time, John Walford is saying that there's no temple in Jerusalem. And so the fact of the matter that right now, Israel is in present occupation of that city, but there's no temple it requires that first a Jewish temple be built, then the sacrifice be reinstituted. He continued by saying, I don't know if you can see this, it may be small, but let me read it to you. This has led to the conclusion that the present possession of Israel of the temple, uh, that the present possession of, the, of Israel of the temple site since 1967 may be a divinely ordered preparation that in God's time, the temple will be rebuilt and sacrifices begun again. Although this is difficult to understand in view of the fact that the shrine, the Dome of the Rock, is apparently on the site of the ancient temple and hinders any present erection of such a temple, many believe that, nevertheless, such a temple will be rebuilt and these prophecies literally fulfilled. We're just in verse 15, but he's raising the fact but right now, Israel is in possession of the temple site since 1967. And Jerusalem right now is a very strange city because it is home to four different major religions of the world. Judaism, the religion of the Jews, Christianity, and now they have the Muslims. And on the site of the temple of the, uh, the temples, uh, the, the ancient temple site right now, uh, there stands the Dome of the Rock, which is a mosque of the Muslims. 
if the Jews are to rebuild their temple there, what will happen to the Dome of the Rock? And if that Dome of the Rock will uh, be replaced by the temple, that will something. That would be something that uh, the Jews that right now is not even good with the Arabs already. That would be uh, chaos, and that would mean uh, most likely war. And yet, uh, according to John Walford, this may be a divinely ordered preparation that in his time, the temple will be rebuilt and the sacrifices begun again. So on seeing this awful sight of the abomination of desolation coming into Jerusalem, if it will be fulfilled in AD 70, the Roman armies would approach the city. What did Jesus advise for the people to do? Verse 16 to verse uh, 20. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is in the housetop not go down to take what this is in his house. Let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. Jesus advises people to flee because this will be a painful and awful destruction and destructive event. He advises to them to flee on the hills, the people of Judea to flee to the hills without even waiting to collect their belongings. If you're in the field working there, go to the mountains directly. Do not come home. The sign is so specific that on the basis of it, Christ advised the children of Israel in Judea at that time to flee to the mountain without hesitation when it occurs. The people on the housetop should not go down as there will be no time to gather provisions. Flee to the mountains. Probably he is referring to the region southeast of Jerusalem, particularly the Dead Sea area, where there are many caves and places of refuge. David himself hid from Saul in this area, and this would include the hills of Moab and Edom. And yet, uh, in AD 70, uh, after the Jeru uh, Jerusalem temple was destroyed, the ancient church historian Eusebius reports that during the Jewish revolt, um, many Christians fled to the mountains. And alas for women, verse 19, who are pregnant for those nursing infant in those days. In, when this happens, women and children would especially suffer because it is hard to flee when you are a woman with a um, pregnant and you have small children taken there with you. And the second hindrance here in verse 20, pray that when this happens, your flight will not happen in winter or on a Sabbath because winter conditions are harsh. It would be hard to flee or uh, the revered traditions of Sabbath would not hinder you or on Sabbath religious re uh, regulations uh, would hinder them or that their absence would be clear because it's the Sabbath and they are traveling. So, question, why did Jesus give this strong advice for the people of Jerusalem to flee when they see the sign of the abomination of desolation? Look at verse 21. Jesus said, For then there would be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now, no and never will B. Christ summarizes these predictions here by saying that there will be a great tribulation coming. The enemy's savage attack would be more terrible and destructive than anything that they had known. Now the phrase here in verse 21, such as has not occurred nor ever will be, identifies this as a yet future time in which God's anger and wrath shall be poured out on the earth. So the event would repeat of the atrocities of Antiochus Epiphanes only many times worse. So though the time of the siege of the and the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 was horrible, the time of Antiochus Epiphanes in 2nd century BC was horrible, but the vision Jesus paints will have an even more horrific fulfillment in the future. Let us look at one verse, Revelation 7, 14. I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of what? The great tribulation. It is 
an event highlighted by this word mega in Greek, great. It will be a time of great trouble, great pain. And um, uh, according to one pastor, he suggested that the period would be a time of unprecedented trouble. Uh, from Revelation 6 to 19, uh, according to the interpretation of Scripture, by that period of three and a half years, there would be hundreds of millions of people die in that short period of time. Now, we will study that in detail So uh, um, next time. But Jesus is describing this period when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel. This will be a period of great tribulation, unprecedented in the history of man. Kind. Now, the tribulation or trouble of this period will be great and unprecedented because the further description here in verse 22, how did Christ describe here? Verse 22, And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. So if God did not stop the butchery or the afflictions of this time, if it were to continue without his intervention, no human being or no life would have been saved. No one would survive or be left alive. The people would be massacred, the temple burned, and the city destroyed. Now, some suggest that this means that if God's wrath were to continue unchecked against the wickedness of humanity, no one would survive this destruction. But the phrase here, but this, for the sake of the elect. But for the sake of those whom he had chosen, which includes all those who follow Christ during this period, the period would be cut short so that his elect or his redeemed people will not suffer anymore or more than they can bear. So the time is cut short or held short of total destruction. Because both Daniel 7.25 and Revelation 12.14 suggest that uh, there is an actual length of the time that the Antichrist or the beast will be permitted to terrorize the world. And that time is fixed to three and a half years. Daniel 7, 25. He shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the, the saints of the Most High. And he shall think to change the times and the law. And they shall be given into his hand. God will allow him to do this for how long? For a time, times, and a half a time. That's two years, uh, sorry, that is three years and a half. Uh, to be clearer, Revelation 11.2, But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for how long? 42 months. That is three this is a specific, the great tribulation time is a specific three and a half period leading up to the second coming. And take note that this should not be confused with the general time of trouble predicted earlier, the one we studied in verse 4 to 14. So the great tribulation accordingly is a specific period of time beginning with verse 15 when you see the abomination of desolation and closing with the second coming of Christ. This is in light of Daniel's prophecies and confirmed by this the reference of the 42 months. Okay, so... It is evident that the reference is not to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, since this destruction, unprecedented in human history, described in Matthew 24, 21, did not take place in AD 70. We have been uh, going along too far now. So let us put a lesson here in verse 15 to verse 23. Our first lesson for this afternoon is this. As painful the general signs of this dying world are, there will be a coming unprecedented great tribulation ushered in by the Antichrist in Jerusalem, but this will, only, this will last only for a limited time for the sake of the elect. Verse 4 to 14 are the characteristics of this age that we are going through right now. There will be 
It will be a period of false cries, wars, famines, earthquakes, pestilences, persecution of believers, increasing lawlessness. But Jesus said in verse 8, these are just the beginning of birth pains. The second sign here, which is very specific, a specific sign that Christ coming is near, is in verse 15, when the Antichrist desecrates the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem, usher in a period of unprecedented, never happened in the history of mankind, a great tribulation. So yes, the Antichrist will set up himself as a world ruler and a god in the very temple dedicated for God, and the world at that time will in the future will experience a great tribulation. But uh, the last phrase of our lesson here, this will last only for a limited time, a, num a time of 42 months to be exact, all for the sake of God's elect, the ones He have chosen that will be alive during that time. That's why there are commentators who believe because the Great Tribulation is unprecedented in history and consists largely in judgments of God on an unbelieving world. So many interpret uh, interpreters have come to the conclusion that the church will not have to go through this period. That's why there are those who believe in the rapture, that God, or in the pre-trib, that God will take out His church by the rapture before the tribulation because they argue that uh, we are waiting for the blessed hope. So if we will go through the tribulation, it will not be a blessed hope. And yet, um, let us just focus because our lesson here is not about the rapture, but about the coming great tribulation as Christ is focusing us here so our first lesson here in verses 15 to 23 is that as painful the general signs of this dying world are, there will be a coming unprecedented great tribulation ushered in by the Antichrist in Jerusalem. But again, this will last only for a limited time for the sake of the elect. Having introduced the specific sign of the second coming, which is the Great Tribulation, Jesus then described other details of this period. Look at verse 23. He says, Then if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it, for false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. So, just as there have been false Christs throughout the age, so there will be an intensification of this at the end of the age. During these times, during the time these troubles were building up, as the great tribulation happens, false prophets would try to draw the disciples of Christ into their false groups. That in verse 24, it will even be they will arise and even be accompanied by performing great signs and wonders to lead people astray. So supernatural signs and miracles will have the appearance of coming from God, but that will actually be the work of Satan and his evil forces. They will be, they will be so convincing so as to mislead people that Christ... Uh, comments here, if possible, even the elect. That's why John the Apostle was the one, um, one of those who heard this originally. He warns believers in 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. So yes, while Jesus says, uh, that it will mislead, if possible, even the elect. Uh, but Jesus himself has said in John 10, 4, that when he has brought out all his own, um, yes, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow because they know, they do not know the voice of strangers. So, um, the point of Christ here in verse 24 and 20, uh, 23 and 24, false Christ and false prophets will arise. 
um, verse 25. See, I have told you beforehand. So if they say to you, look, he's in the wilderness, do not go out. Or if they say, look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. Be, behold, I have told you before. Here, Jesus was referring to his frequent mention of false prophets. Christ warned them numerous times in Matthew 7, in Matthew 15, in Matthew 16, in Matthew 23. Jesus has warned them so many times about false Christ. So while false Christ and false prophets have always been in evidence, they will especially be prominent at the end of the age in Satan's final attempt to do what? To turn people, to deceive people from placing their faith in Christ. Their clever tricks is doing this. They will say to people, look, he is in the wilderness. Look, he is in the inner rooms. They will comfort people with words and assure them that the Messiah has returned. And their strategy is they will deceive people that the Messiah is hiding in, a, in some safe place place, waiting to lead his people to victory. Nga kung sa ilunggo pa, gapabukot pa ang Messiah, si Kristo, gapanago sa disyerto or sa secret nga room. But what did Jesus say? Verse 26, do not believe it. Why? Verse 27, he says, For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Rather than being secretly hidden in the wilderness, waiting to come in victory with his disciples, or he is secretly hidden in a private room, no, his coming will appear like what? There are two figures here to explain his actual coming. First, in verse 27, like lightning. It will be sudden, it will be open, it will be visible to all and startling. It will shock everyone as a flash of lightning. So those who believe in the prophetic scripture will have no difficulty in identifying the second coming of Christ. Because as lightning is a public event, the, coming, the second coming of Christ will not be secret, but it will be a public event. It will be witnessed both by believers and unbelievers because the heavens will be ablaze with the glory of God. Revelation 1.7, he says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him, those who rejected him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on the account of him. The second figure here in verse 28 is wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. Wherever there is a dead body in the wilderness, vultures will be seen circling around that dead corpse. It will even be visible and predictable to all those who are near or even it will be seen from afar. But the figure in verse 28, some suggest that because there is a vulture and there is the word corpse here, it, will, it suggests that there will be widespread death that will accompany the return of Christ to judge those who have rejected his kingdom. But all in all, verse 27 to 28, taken together, it means that when Christ returns, no one will miss them. And no one can mistake the fact that Jesus the Messiah has truly come. Because it will be sudden, it will be open, it will be public, it will be visible to all. So, our lesson here in verses 23 to 28 is this. The deceptive work of false prophets will intensify. We have learned in the general signs in verse 4 to 14 that Jesus warns of his disciples of the deceptive work of false Christ. But it will further intensify. They will mislead people. They will deceive people, making them think that Christ has already come. But the second coming of Jesus will be sudden. It will be clear. It will be visible to all and even deadly. Why? Because at his coming, he will bring judgment. Nevertheless, 
they will be these false prophets will become more convincing and in fooling the world to believe their prophecies to mislead people from placing their faith in Christ they will be accompanied by satan empowered signs and wonders but when god's great intervention eventually occur the second coming of jesus the true messiah the coming of the messiah will be like a lightning plain and clear for all to see. Lastly, verse 29 to 31. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of heaven will be shaken. The, the word immediately after the tribulation of those days is a signal in verse 29 to a clear connection to the time of great tribulation described in verse 15 to 28. So Jesus did not return at the fall of Jerusalem nor immediately after. So it seems then that his, this prophecy in verse 29 to 31 still awaits its greater fulfillment. If that is so, there could be a repeat of conditions such as those during the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, uh, as similarly described here in verse 15 to 28, but on a wider scale and with greater intensity. What will happen after the tribulation in those days? Immediately, verse 29, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Now, people understand this in two ways. One, it is figurative. They say that this is a figurative language about heavenly distances echoing the Old Testament prophets, pointing to the figure of um, political judgment on nations and governments. For example, in Isaiah 13.10, Isaiah said, For the stars of heavens and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising and the moon will not shed its light. Isaiah 34, 4, All the host of heaven shall rot away. The skies roll up like a scroll. All their hosts shall fall as leaves from the vine, like leaves falling from the fig tree. Joel 2, 10, To describe the day of the Lord, the his coming, the earth quakes before them, the heaven trembles, the sun and the moon are darkened, the stars withdraw their shining. For them, their people believe that this is only a figurative language, that there will be a judgment on nations and governments. But there are those who believe that this is possibly entirely a literal language, which is the ultimate fulfillment of prophecies that would take place during the time of the reign of the beast with the stars falling perhaps referring to a large meteor shower the sun will not give its light there will be darkness there will be disturbance in the heavens because this has literally happened before uh, when Jesus died three hours the world went dark and the idea of stars falling and heavens being rolled up is mentioned elsewhere in the Bible, Hebrews 1.12, like a robe, you will roll up uh, the, the sky. 2 Peter 3.7, the heavens that now exist, heavens and earth that now exist are stored up or prepared for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Chapter 3, verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief and then the heavens will pass away with a roar. It will die, mapatay, but with a bang, with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed, or in the literal translation of this, will be destroyed. Verse 12, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. Heavenly bodies are already hot, stars are already hot, and yet they will melt as they burn. Now, according to the theory of scientists, many scientists believe that the world started with the Big Bang. But these verses are saying that the earth and the heavens, this earth and this heavens, and this heaven will end 
with a bang. Revelation 6.13 And the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale or a wind. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up and every mountain and, and island was removed from its place. Now, um, what uh, Christ is saying here is that whether these events are to be understood as figurative or literal, it is clear that in verse 29, there will be earth-shattering events through which when this will happen, sun will not give its light, the moon will be dark, the stars will fall, there will be meteor, there, all creation will be radically transformed. As Peter has said uh, here in 2 Peter 3.13, we are waiting for what? We are waiting for the new heavens and the new earth. But this would come because the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then what will happen? Verse um, 30. Then, this is another time, um, uh, a word indicating time. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Here is what we have been waiting for. Then the Son of Man will appear. But there is an interesting phrase here in verse 30. Then will appear in heaven or in the sky the sign of the Son of Man. That's why some believe that there could have been, there could be a banner or a signboard or something that, we will, that people will see in the sky when Christ comes again on the heaven as he returns with power and great glory. While some believe that the sign on the heaven when the Son of Man comes is the Son of Man himself. So either there will be a banner telling people that, hey, the Son of Man has come, or that the sign is the Son of Man himself coming. Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in glory of his Father. Matthew 26, 64. Jesus said this before he was crucified. Jesus said to him, you have said so, but I tell you from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. When he comes, how will the earth react to it? Verse 30, then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. The tribes of the earth will mourn. Interesting. Interesting. The Son of Man comes, and yet they are not excited to welcome Him. Rather, they mourn. Either they mourn because this would be a sorrow that would produce repentance, because they would dread, they would tremble at the sight of His coming, they would repent, or it would be a mourning because it would be a great sadness of regret in light of His coming judgment, because for many, it will be too late. So the tribes of the earth will mourn over the rejection of the Messiah. Then they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. Now the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven takes us back to Daniel. Because this is not the first time that this phrase was used in the Bible. Daniel 7.13 uh, uh, 7, and 14. Daniel saw in his night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like what? A son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given a dominion, sorry, and to him was given a dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. That's why when Christ say, when Christ said to the, to the high priest, you will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of glory. He was referring to Daniel 7.13. 
because he was referring to himself as the son of man of Daniel that will receive dominion, glory, and a kingdom. The Messiah is king. This is the Messiah. And this will be fulfilled um, when the Son of Man appears. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7-8 And to grant to you a relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord, coming with great glory and power. He's coming to judge. He's coming to, to, um, he's coming to gain victory. Verse 9. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might when He comes on that day to be glorified in His saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was to those who reject Him, they will suffer punishment, but He comes on that day to be glorified in His saints. And we will not, He will not only be glorified among us saints who believe, but to be marveled at we will wonder at the sight of him coming. Now, interesting, the word son of man is a designation, a, a favorite self-designation of Christ because he used this designation to indicate the true meaning of his identity and his ministry. It was used by Christ to refer to himself as the humble servant who has come to forgive sinners or as a suffering servant whose death and resurrection will redeem his people. But this final reference about the Son of Man is the glorious King and Judge who will return to establish God's kingdom on earth. So with power and great glory, Christ will be revealed as the eternal ruler of the kingdom of God, designated by the Ancient of Days to receive worship and to exercise dominion over the earth and all of its inhabitants. Our lesson here in verse 29 to 30 is this. The Messiah who has come to die and resurrected for man's sin will come again as a victorious and glorious king and judge over all the earth. Our Savior that came to purchase our redemption humbled himself and resisted to exercise his physical rule on earth. He even resisted to force his physical rule on earth that he created. Think of this. He is the Son of Man that will be given dominion. But at his first coming, he refused to force this dominion upon the earth. Because he chose to save us first. And he started ruling not on a throne on earth, but in human hearts of those whom he have purchased, whom he have saved and redeemed from sin. But verse 30 is telling us definitely he will come again in great glory and victory to be what? To be king over all the earth. Not only to rule over the earth, but to judge those who rejected him in sin. So the return of Christ will be a literal event. Why do I know that? The, the angels told his disciples, This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way. Physically, he will come again. And lastly, in verse 31, what will he do? And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from the one end of heaven to another. Now in the Bible, a trumpet call, whenever there is a trumpet call, it is associated in Jewish end time thought and also in Christian writings with the appearance of the Messiah. They would think that when there is a loud trumpet call, both Jews and Christians in the Bible would think that the Messiah would appear. Uh, Isaiah 18.3 all you inhabitants of the world, you who dwell on the earth, when a signal is raised on the mountains, look. When a trumpet is blown, hear. Isaiah 27, uh, sorry, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, and the vo with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God. 
And when the trumpet is sounded, the dead in Christ will rise. When the trumpet is sounded, what will his angels do? Verse 31, And they will gather his elect from the four winds, from the one end of heaven to another. Now the involvement of angels probably indicates that when Jesus returns, he will not only gather himself, all believers alive on earth at that time, but will also bring with him all the redeemed who are in heaven. 1 Thessalonians 4.14, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those whom have fallen asleep. Now, while some believe that the, the elect that he will gather here is Israel, some believe that this um, uh, probably is a reference to all those who are chosen, that is, the saints of all ages, whether they are on heaven or on earth at that time, for all will converge or will meet upon the millennial kingdom when Christ returns to earth. Our last lesson here in verse 31, uh, 30 to 31 is this. Jesus, our Messiah, will come again in glory and power to reign and to judge the earth. Thus, what does this mean to the sinful believing world when he comes? And what does it mean to believers? When Christ comes again in glory and power to reign and to judge the earth, the sinful unbelieving world will mourn his coming. They will mourn because they will be judged by the Messiah whom they rejected. Now we will learn in the book of Revelation that many of them are still hard-headed. Their hearts are still, um, are still resisting him, rejected him, no matter how he will allow them to suffer that great in a time of great tribulation. And yet when they see the Son of Man whom they have pierced, whom they have rejected, they will mourn in regret because they have rejected him. But the elect will be gathered to be with him. So this, I believe, is an intentional contrast set forth by Christ to the glorious event of his coming for both unbelievers and believers who are his elect. I believe that Christ inserting the reaction both of unbelievers and believers here, he wants us to feel and respond or react to him in some form or manner. If unbelievers will mourn, I would believe that believers will rejoice at the coming of their beloved Savior because he will come to be their physical king over all creation. So... Believe, unbelievers will mourn and the elect or the believers will be gathered in salvation with him rejoicing. So let us return to our question as we recap this study. And our question for this study is this. What will be the sign of the coming of Jesus and the close of the age? And when will these things be? Our application for um, Matthew 24, 15 to 31 is this. Jesus is the glorious Messiah to rule and judge the earth, will come after the definite period of unprecedented great tribulation ushered in by the Antichrist in Jerusalem. Now, while verse 4 to 14 of Matthew 24 are general signs, one specific sign we are waiting to happen is verse 15 to 28. This sign is the sign of the Antichrist, the abomination of desolation, the great tribulation. Now take note that the center stage for that sign, as was prophesied, is Jerusalem. To those who are looking at current events, they are watching this closely because Israel was recognized as a nation in our time, in our generation, in the year 1947, after the World War. But interestingly, just recently, Donald Trump, it was Donald Trump who recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. So now we have 
a nation Israel, but that prior to that, prior to 1947, was not recognized that they are a people, but they don't have a land. Since 1947, they have a land. 1967, they are in possession of the city of Jerusalem. And just last, I think just a few years ago, because Donald Trump's son-in-law, uh, I think he is the, the husband of Ivanka, he is an American Jew. He's one of the panel that recognized, that moved Trump to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel rather than Tel Aviv. So, it may happen in our generation or it may not. But it is something we are clearly told about. Now, I have a kuya who happened to tour uh, Israel. And in Jerusalem, he said, he shared to me that their tour guide was a Jew. He is not a Christian. He is a Jew. And he, 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 the tour guide told them that preparations are being made to rebuild the temple. The Jewish people are preparing to rebuild the temple. That when the right time comes, they will be ready to rebuild the temple. So taken as a whole, the second coming of Christ is a majestic event. It will not be instantaneous like the rapture, but it extends over many hours. This perhaps explains why everyone can see it, because in the course of a day, the earth will rotate and the entire world will be able to see the coming of Christ accompanied by the host of heaven, which he will physically descend on earth on Mount of Olives. So the entire passage of Matthew 24, 15 to 31 is the specific answer to the disciples of the sign of his coming and of the end of the age. The climactic uh, sign being the second coming and the glory that comes with it will fulfill the prophecy of Acts 1 that Christ returns the same way as he went into heaven. The return of Christ will be physical, will be gradual, will be visible, and with clouds. So Matthew 24, 31 brings to a close the doctrinal section of this teaching. And what follows from verse 32 onwards will be the applications and illustrations. So while I want us to be practical, it cannot uh, be avoided that we are learning the facts, what will happen before what we will do. So uh, I think I've, I've talked with Jen last time, what were, the re what were the applications or the reactions of the D group session? Many of you uh, reacted, I, will be, I want to be prepared, I want to be ready, and this and that. The preparation, the readiness, the reaction, the response, the practicality will be next time, will be filled with that. But before we react on what to do, we have to know what will happen first. Now, let me close with this story. There is uh, a guy by the name of Dr. Guinness. He had spoken on the imminent return of the Lord Jesus. And he used the following illustration to show how he knew that the, that the coming was near. He had heard the musical piece or the musical presentation called the Messiah with great delight the previous evening. Now he said, if a man had asked him after that great musical performance on the, the Messiah, entitled the Messiah, had proceeded or, or it had gone on for a couple of hours, how long he thought it would continue, he would have answered that guy about five minutes. But the man asking him might have protested, how can that be? Because he said, it is in full swing, has been going on for two hours, and I see no reason why it should not continue for two hours longer. How do you know it will be over in five minutes? Then, then Dr. Guinness would say, I should have answered him because I have the score. The score is a musical term for the music piece. I have the copy of the piece that they are singing and playing in this musical um, presentation. So Dr. Guinness would say to him, don't you remember that beautiful solo? And he would have said, yes, and that chorus, yes. And 
Then I should have said to him, and I know it will soon be over because I have the score and they are singing the last chorus. Now, the point of this story is this. It is a wonderful thing to have the score so that you may follow the events that lead to this coming of Christ. It is a wonderful thing for us to know what will happen so that we will follow events that lead to his coming. Perhaps soon the present will be past and God's new day will dawn. We are near his coming. How near, we do not know. But one thing we do know, it cannot be long. Now, right now, we are living in the, general, uh, in the time of general signs of verse 4 to 14. But what are we to expect of his coming? We are looking and watching for the signs of verse 15. Mark that out in your Bible. The abomination of desolation, the great tribulation of verse 15 to 28. We have the score. We have the plans of God. We have been formed informed of this specific sign. So again, while I want to be more practical than this, the practical responses concerning the coming of Christ and the coming end will be laid out in the sections that will follow. So it is good for us to focus on the truths that will prompt our actions. We first have to be clear on what will happen. And this we have learned what will happen before what we will do. Next time, we'll just spend it there on what we will do in light of what will happen just as Christ has taught us here. So to close us in this message, Jesus, the glorious Messiah, to rule and judge the earth will come after the definite period of unprecedented great tribulation ushered in by the Antichrist in Jerusalem. If there's one practical application right now that you can do, look at Jerusalem. What will happen there will signal the coming end. So keep your eye on Jerusalem because that is the center stage of this event. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for your word that you have not hidden the truth of your coming to us, the truth of the coming end to us. I pray that you would enable us to see this clearly and to believe it with all our might, not to be alarmed and to look after every evidences, but to be clear of important truths of your coming. We thank you that you have revealed this to us so that we can feel, we can act, and we, pre we can prepare properly and accordingly. Bless your words in our hearts. This is our prayer. As we await the coming of the Son of Man, with power and great glory in the clouds of heaven. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Shall we sing our song of the month? Uh, this was supposed to be our uh, camp song, our theme song in our family camp, but uh, we did not have the chance to sing it. Uh, this was the song that Kin uh, sang prior to the message. So let us try to learn and uh, meditate through the message of this commitment song. Uh, this song is by Sovereign Grace and it is entitled, All of Our Tomorrows. Thank 
cautious age, determine not the steps we choose. Great Shepherd, guide us through each day. Oh, how we want to follow you. Come, living way, our way may clear. Let perfect love drive out of fear. Be thou our vision now and here, and all of our tomorrows. When winter makes us reminisce of warmer days so distant now, of cherished saints the sun once kissed. Whose beauty passed behind the clouds Let all our fond and longing tears Remind us we are pilgrims here We trust you, Sovereign, all our years With all of our tomorrow Pray, Father, we thank you for the blessing of this worship, even though uh, we remotely did this, and yet we know that um, where the Spirit and our truth seeks to come and worship you, their true worship is being offered. And so we praise you for what you have done and who you have been, how you have revealed yourself to us all throughout the year 2020. And you, O faithful God, our refuge in all generations, is still the same God that we can hold on to, we can still trust, and we can still face this year, this day, and tomorrow, and all of our tomorrows, because we know that you are the God who will finish what you have began. So thank you for revealing to us yourself, your plans for all the ages, in the days to come in your word and we thank you that you're not only the God of tomorrow but you are the God that we can trust and hold on today so be with us and be with our family be with our loved ones here and at home in the Philippines and wherever they are we thank you for the blessing of your word and I pray that this worship has glorified and honored your name that is worthy to be offered before the altar the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips that is fitting unto your glorious name. This is our prayer. May the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.
good afternoon and happy Lord's Day to everyone. At your command, the old departs, the new year comes, and though celestial is your game, you search and care for all our ways. We offer up to you this day, and all of what tomorrow. not the steps we choose Great Shepherd guides us through each day Oh, how we want to follow you Come living way, our way make clear Let perfect love drive out our fear Be thou our vision now and here all of our tomorrow When winter makes us reminisce Of warmer days so distant now A cherished saints the sun once kissed Whose beauty passed behind the clouds let all our fond and longing tears Remind us we are pilgrims here We trust you sovereign of our years With all of our tomorrows And to the plow we're pressing on and running hard to win the prize empowered by the love of God 